Thank you, Desmond. It's really good to see old friends. And very excited to see Wendy too. I learned something new about Wendy today. <laughs> Navigating crosswinds and sexuality after the repeal of 377A in Singapore. Where does the church go from here? Are some of the questions we ask occasionally. I think one of the challenges um, in terms of a church responding to the challenges relating to sexuality is that we often have only two responses. And one is we hibernate, that means we keep very, very quiet. And secondly, we hyperventilate. So when there was a uh, discussion of sexuality in society, we start to breathe very fast, we fire more WhatsApp texts than we ever done in our entire lives uh, for a very short period of time. So you will find that the church's response sometimes toggle between hyperventilation and hibernation, where we just keep very, very quiet. What does the Word of God have to say to us today. As we look at the text carefully, we can see that actually Jesus was confronted with a particular issue. Some Pharisees came to test him, the text tells us. And what does that mean? Jesus was in a situation where he was asked certain questions. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? And that is the question that frames the rest of the sermon today. When we look at a text that was read for us earlier on, the second question that was asked of Jesus is, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? So Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to do so, to have a divorce, because your hearts were hard. So now we have the second key question. So the first question is, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? The second question is, if the law permits that, why did God allow for it? Okay. And then the third frame is Jesus' reply. Not everybody can accept this. And then now Jesus goes into an extended reply regarding eunuchs. So how do we... Let the text guide us in our consideration of how Christians are to engage in the public square as well as care for people in a personal level. To help us think through this controversial area of sexuality, I'm going to help you by defining some terms. And this is where I often get very interesting feedback. Those who are older will say, you need to have printed this slide for us before the sermon so we can remember as you speak. And the younger people will say, why are you taking so long to define these terms? Sexual orientation, when I see your handsome pastor as a guy and I like him, um, sorry Wendy, I didn't know you were sitting next to him. <laughs> when I see him and I like him, that is same-sex attraction. If I see a beautiful woman or a woman that is very attractive to me emotionally and I like her, that is heterosexual attraction. Okay, I'm not going to name a person here. Sexual orientation therefore consists of three parts. One is the romantic and the emotional attraction. Secondly is the identity that I hold. I am indeed same-sex attracted. And then lastly is the behavior. Biological sex, the word refers to simply male and female. There is a slightly newer word in the scene today called gender. And gender refers to the way that we think and feel. So I'm a guy. I may think I'm a guy or I may think I'm a girl. So gender is a word to talk about the emotional response to my biology. And for most of us, as a guy, and I feel like a guy, I am therefore called cisgender. In other words, how I feel about my sex matches my biology. I understand that in Singapore, there is a desire to think carefully about our role in controversy. Looking back at the text in Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 to 9, you see that Jesus was asked a difficult question. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? And here, the text actually tells us Jesus got himself involved. Jesus replied to the question in verse 4. 19 verse 4 tells us, haven't you read? He replied. And so Jesus was prepared to give a reply to a controversial question in his time. At that time, he did not choose to keep quiet. In other words, for Christians today, it is important to get involved if, it's for, if it is of 
foundational and fundamental importance in society and in our lives. Today, if you keep quiet in this important area of sexuality, your children will be struggling for guidance. If you and I keep quiet, society will begin to evolve in ways that we did not even think was possible. In the past, it used to be that when pastors committed sexual sins, they may be asked to step down from pastoring. Today, in certain jurisdictions in the world, a pastor can be asked to step down if he refuses to ordain same-sex marriage. So that is the difference of how far the world has shifted, even within the context of a church. If we are to stick to certain foundational beliefs that we have about sexuality, the question is why? What we do see in Matthew chapter 19 in the earlier text is that Jesus was willing to get involved. Secondly, you find that Jesus' reply was interesting. At the beginning, the Creator made them male and female, and for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be reunited to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. How did Jesus get involved in controversy? He used a technique that was familiar to the religious leaders of his time. Because there were two camps in the religious world. One say you can chintai divorce. The other one say you only can divorce under strict parameters. But what Jesus was saying is this. Beyond these two ideas is an even more fundamental idea, which is what was God's intention. The original is weightier, carries more weight than the contemporary thinking of that time of any old how divorcing or divorcing with strict parameters. He was using a thought pattern that was familiar to his religious audience. Today, there is a call to the church that if we are to be engaging in public square conversations, is our message intelligible to our audience? It needs to be intelligible, it needs to be persuasive, and it needs to be livable. Let me break it down for you. Number one, intelligible. It has to make sense to them. So Jesus was using a method of engaging the audience of his time in a way that makes sense to them because he used a thought pattern and a dialogue method that the religious leaders were very used to. Secondly, it has to be persuasive. He persuaded them on the basis of what they knew to be fundamental. And thirdly, it has to be livable. The text tells us that God understood how difficult it was for men and women to stick to the covenant of marriage and he actually came into the world, walked into the world, understood why men and women may want to divorce and then brought them back to God's intention. The incarnation is a desire and a willingness of God to walk into the world of humans before giving them an opportunity to consider whether they want to walk out with Him in a very gentle manner. Because God actually said the permission was even given even though it was not God's primary intention. And today, perhaps, I'm always very aware that when I'm speaking to any audience of reasonable size, different people will be struggling with different aspects of sexuality. So this is God who at his, in his deepest depths of his heart has certain things that really resonated with his heart, but he's willing to hold that in a box and come into your box. It doesn't mean that God has no views on the matter. As Jesus reminded the Pharisees of the time, there were some fundamental truths. Man, woman, joy in marriage. The bond is so strong that God's intention was that these two were not separate. However, God understood the burden of marital covenant as beautiful as it is. And God was willing to come into that world of pain. But he reminded them that God's fundamental desire was that these two persons will come together to reflect his desires. Today, 
we need to understand this. We have a role in controversy. We have a role in societal controversies when it's of foundational importance. Will you choose to speak up in a manner that is intelligible, in other words, understandable? Will you choose to speak in a manner that is persuasive? And will you choose to speak in a manner that is livable? Jesus, in giving and reminding them of Moses' permission, was not saying that divorce is God's intention. Far from it. But he was saying that, hey, God understood how difficult it can be sometimes to walk according to his intentions and he's willing to come into your world. When it's important, it passes there for a longer time. How does God provide? Okay, I understand that Singaporeans often want their children to pass PSLE, okay? Man and woman, is there a distinct difference? Before you and I were born, when the sperm meets the egg, the genetics were fixed. Whether you and I will continue to be a man or a woman, for a male, XY, for a female, XX. Are there people with difficulties in between? There are. It's a range of conditions known as intersex. But overall, in the majority of the population, you will find that sex is actually wired from the time before we were born. When you hit the time that you were born, straight away, by looking, you can kind of tell a male has testes and a female has vagina and ovaries. By the time you hit puberty, the levels of testosterone in males go very high and it's a fairly constant amount. Women will have cycles preparing them for childbearing. By the time you go through puberty, there will be a rapid acceleration of muscle mass in males. And for females, you're functioning at about half, at most 75% of men when it comes to muscle mass. Again, suggesting that there's a clear difference between male and female. The body mass of males are generally higher than the females. If you look at the bone structures, okay, and I understand that some people will say that archaeologically is controversial, but if you look at the male and the female pelvis, there are at least 18 different anatomical differences between the two sexes, and I shall only point out one. Okay, if you look at the slide carefully, you'll see that there's a circle here, whereas the shape of the male pelvis is a little bit different because female pelvis are designed for babies to go through the, male, the, the birth canal. So when you look at these differences, while, none of, while you can quote the exceptional situation where it may be difficult to distinguish between the two sexes, you can actually see that before birth, at birth, during your growth process, during puberty, after childbearing, that there is a clear distinction between the two sexes. And when man and woman comes together, God had actually provided for life to come forth from that union. So in thinking that we need to blur the relationships between male and female, Really, we are challenged to think carefully about what God has provided. Even if we do not believe in God, these distinct characteristics, if we are honest with ourselves, suggest that we are designed for a certain purpose and we are designed for a certain reason. As we look at these today, we can take a very detached view and say that, oh, these are just scientific facts. It's true. But I also want to say this. The facts point us to a more fundamental truth, which is that God provides for that which He calls for. He calls for men and women to come together in holy matrimony. He calls for men and women to come together to give forth life. He wires His universe to provide for that. Today, I don't know what difficulties you are going through in your life. I just want to say this to you. God provides. 
Sometimes when we are struggling with our struggles, our focus is on our sexual struggles, our focus is on our financial troubles, our focus is on our marital troubles, and we are struggling and we are putting in a lot of effort just to be a better person. God sees your efforts today and He sees how tired you are. Perhaps today it is a good day to take a step back and see what God is wanting to do for us, what God has done for us. For those of us in ministry, sometimes we can get so excited doing things for God that we forget to look at what God has actually done for us. As you look at the biological provisions to support the institution of marriage between male and female, I just want to encourage you to think a little bit deeper into the foundational truth, which is that that which God calls for, that which God desires to see in us, He will provide. On a more personal testimony, when I went to Indonesia, I left my job as a professional, just like uh, Desmond did. I remember uh, one of my colleagues, very kind, told me, you're giving up a career, you're going to staff. Okay? And I went to Indonesia to serve among the under-resourced communities, and that was where I met Desmond and Wendy. I came back after many years uh, in the mission field, serving in different under-resourced communities. I just want to tell you, I have biochemical proof that God provides. My cholesterol has gone up. <laughs> it doesn't speak well of my spirituality. I'm obviously struggling with some degree of indulgence here and there as, I, as my age advances, but it does not take away the fundamental truth, which is I'm obviously not suffering too badly. God provides. God provides for you biologically. It doesn't take away the difficulties that we have. What then are the implications on discipleship? Number one, the two sexes are different and complementary. God meant for women and men to be united. And we need to be comfortable meeting with people where they are. What if they are same-sex attracted? You will find that the person who is same-sex attracted meaning as a guy, I like another guy, or a woman, she likes another woman, is there are four distinct spaces. And I point this out because sometimes we look at those who are struggling with sexuality as if they are alien from outer space, only one kind. And that is not true. If you look at this slide, I have briefly given you some of the struggles that these articulate for us in their journeys. Firstly, there's a struggle of awareness. They begin to say, hey, I'm a little bit different. It may be a story that says, I'm hitting puberty and I begin to realize that my desires, my sexual desires is for same-sex people. There may be a time of awareness. Then there will be a time of the awareness and then they will be thinking, is this truly me or is it a passing face? All right, that's where they're trying to concretize their identity. Sometimes there may be fluidity. For example, one of the big questions is, is sexual orientation changeable? And if you listen to the different stories, you will find that some start very young, and from young they have this desire, suggesting that there's certain predisposition. But there, is, there are also people who change this all the time. And if you listen to the stories of domestic helpers in Singapore, some of them start out heterosexual in the neighboring countries. They are married in their home countries. They come to Singapore, they work very hard, send money home every month, and then their husbands back home find another woman. In Singapore, they find comfort in an older woman, and they get into a situation of same-sex attraction. This tells us that not everyone who is same-sex attraction is the same, because some have a higher predisposition, some due to situations, and some may change along the way, one way or the other. So it's important when we come into a controversial issue like this, that we do not take a one-size-fits-all. It's really important to listen to the story of the person before we focus on their behavior. Because sometimes we are very disturbed by the behavior that we see. We forget that behind any particular behavior are genuine people with certain unique circumstances. A young girl who may have gotten out of a physically or sexually abusive heterosexual relationship may be more prone to a same-sex relationship the next time around. There are really different reasons why someone will come to a point of moving from awareness 
to identity and sometimes from identity moving out or in of the sexual orientation and behavior that they choose to hold on to. And it's important for the church to think through these carefully. What then do our kids need? Okay, I'm going to go one step at a time. Huh? Firstly, our kids need early, systematic, age-appropriate sexuality discussion. Let's move away from this hibernation and hyperventilation approach. Secondly, we need clear teaching on the benefits of going through puberty. Sometimes we get so distracted that we forget to teach our children the basics, which is when you go through puberty, what are some of the developmental stages that are needed in order for us to understand who we are in a particular season of our lives. And truth be told, some of us never quite discover the call of God in each season of our life, even when we are pretty old. And today, I just want to remind us that our kids need to see us seeking God at every season of our lives. Our kids also need a kind and sound environment when they are navigating sexuality concerns. And this nuanced approach starts from bringing things to the heart as Jesus did in the conversation in Matthew chapter 19. He, asked the, he brought the Pharisees to come to ask a simple question. Then why did Moses permit us to have a divorce? And Jesus' reply was, because your hearts are hardened. Today, perhaps in church, there are two variations of hardening. For some of us, we embrace redefinition of marriage very easily. And the question today, if I may ask you, is are our hearts hardened against God's prerogative to set parameters in our lives? For some of us, we may think, oh, I have no issue with this man and woman thing. The question remains the same. Does God have the right or the prerogative to set the parameter for your life? For those of us who are nearing retirement age group, uh, sometimes our retirement plans are untouchable. You know why young people can feel very judged? Because when they come to church, older people are always prepared to challenge young people about their sexuality choices, but we are not prepared to allow God to challenge our retirement plans. And they don't see that kind of even-handedness in church congregations today. Can I encourage us, whatever stage in our lives, are you and I prepared to allow God to have the prerogative to challenge our motives, intentions, behaviors, and choices. For those of us who are disturbed by these redefinitions, are our hearts hardened against people who are navigating a different set of challenges? All of us have a slightly different cross to carry, but are we hardened against those who carry a different cross? carry a different burden, navigating their way out of their sinful dispositions. Jesus focused on God's handiwork and God's intentions. And if you look at the text, it tells us that Jesus was prepared to take a very nuanced approach. It was very personal. In a time where people didn't talk about sexuality too openly, Jesus actually broke down for us in the passage. Eunuchs from birth, eunuchs from castration, and eunuchs by choice. And if you look at these three categories, all three categories, though different biologically, were invited to the kingdom. In other words, no matter what sexuality, predispositions, choices, or behavior that you are in, you are invited to the kingdom. No matter what stage of life you are in, whether it is forced by the circumstances, pushed by your biology, or because of the impact of other people's choices, you and I have a place in the kingdom of heaven. And Matthew chapter 19 sits on a promise in prophet Isaiah's writings. In Isaiah 56, thus says the Lord, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose the things that please me, and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. So this tells us a certain truth. There were three groups of people that Jesus was talking about. Eunuchs from birth, not by their choice. Eunuchs from castration, people who navigated sexuality at that time as a result of the impact of other people's actions. 
eunuchs by choice, people who chose to live a certain way due to whatever circumstances that are not stated in the text. But to all these three groups, the Lord is saying, you are never an afterthought. A few hundred years before Matthew, the Lord already held the eunuchs in mind. There is, however, a call. Wherever we are, whatever categories we are in, the fundamental question is still the same. Will we choose to be people who begin to choose the things that pleases God and hold fast to Him? In other words, there is a distinct call. No matter our cross, no matter our predisposition, no matter our temptations, we are called to think the thoughts that pleases God. We are called to think the way God thinks and feel for the things that God feels for and the people. And God says, eunuchs are despised in that time, but he chose to give them the status of sons and daughters. And today you may feel despised even within the context of a religious community. God is saying to you, you are not an afterthought. You too will be given the capacity if you choose to surrender to Jesus, the capacity to once again begin to choose the things that pleases God and holding fast to Him even as He has held fast to you across hundreds of years. Do not despair. At this point, as I conclude, I just want to conclude by sharing a personal testimony. When I was much younger, I remember a season of my life I was very unhappy about my own spirituality because I struggled with the way I thought about women. And I think that is a fairly common struggle among men. And I remember a distinct time where I sought help from another Christian brother. I told the Christian brother, you know, I'm struggling with the way I think about women sexually. I sought help from a Christian leader, hoping that he would give me some hope. The Christian leader told me, I'm so glad you shared, but I have the same problem. I was like, <laughs> not quite the answer I was hoping for, but okay, never mind. I felt some companionship. So the two of us, okay, never mind. It's okay. We can find a third person. We found a third person and we said the same thing. You know, both of us are, now, now it's a bit different. Both of us are struggling. Uh, we thought we'd get some advice from you. The third brother said, I have the same issue. And <laughs> the three of us was like, oh dear, the three of us are going to go hell together, man. And then it was at a Christian meeting. One day a speaker spoke, not on the topic of sexuality, but he spoke on the topic of the reality of God coming into our lives and helping us ache through the decisions and the difficulties of life. He wasn't talking about sexuality at all. The three of us felt that this man had experienced God. And we felt a sense of hope. We went to him after the service. And I was really praying. We're going to tell him that we have a problem. And please, God, let him not tell us that he is the same as us. But what he said was interesting. He said, I too have the same issues. But God has given me the grace to walk through it in accordance to his ways. The topic was not on sexuality, but simply because of that one sentence, we latched on like thirsty human beings glimpsing water for the first time. And we met up with him over the next two years, and slowly but surely, he helped us navigate our issues with sexuality. The reason I'm standing here preaching the gospel today is because I tasted the reality of the gospel. It is true that as men and women, we do not have the capacity to walk out of the predicament of our own sinful predisposition. But we have a God who is willing to come into our world. And today there's a challenge to the people of God. Are we willing to go into the world of other people just like my mentor did? So that we can go into the world of another and alongside them, walk with them if they choose to allow us to do so. So in conclusion, to my fellow brothers and sisters and friends, we have a responsibility to be persuasive in the public square, to be intelligible, to be persuasive, and to make life livable. 
if I'm a same-sex attracted person and I come to your church, after church, when you go for lunch with your families and I'm alone, will you invite me? We need to persevere in serving those who are navigating these concerns. We need to continue to hold to a fundamental truth that we pursue God on His terms. Because when we let go of that, we become truly lost. If we are already feeling lost today, the solution is not to throw away the compass. The solution is to hold the hands of a kind guide who is extending His divine hand to us today. And lastly, as a call to the church, these issues are here to stay. We need to be systematic in the way that we prepare our children, start young, and go systematically. Do not hyperventilate or, hyper or hibernate any longer. I just want to extend this uh, invitation to you today. Remember, you and I are never an afterthought. God holds you in the palm of His hands.